Thank you. Uh, hello and welcome to the KCP community meeting Tuesday, December 14th, 2021. Um, we have a pretty exciting, pretty packed agenda today. Um, I wanted to call out, we are not going to have one of these next week, December 21st. Um, we might not have one the next week also, I'm realizing. So this may be the last one of the year. Um, if that's the case, I will uh, make sure to broadcast that more publicly. But at least we know we're not having one next week, December 21st. Uh, if you join, you will be alone. Or, you know, maybe other people will join and you can talk to them about it, whatever you want. Um, uh, great. With that out of the way, we have some stuff on the agenda and I will hand it over to um, Josh to talk about initial work on Sinker and OCM. Josh, you're here, right? I am sorry, my last meeting ran over. All right, uh, yes. Yeah, so I put this on at the last minute because, to be honest, we <laughs> we worked out all the kinks at the very last minute. Uh, but we wanted to get it in before we'd have to wait till the new year to at least show our initial initial take at it. Um, let me post quickly in the chat. So this is the repo the demo is coming from. Uh, I also need to give credit where credit is due. I did not write any of this code. Uh, I am just the demonstrator. Uh, Cho Jen wrote this code and actually has put a couple of pull requests back against uh, the the KCP from some of this work that he came across. And I'll point some of that out as we're, we're going through it. He is in China, though, and it's 1 a.m. there or 12 a.m something like that which is why i i'm doing the demonstration but and i think i saw dario joined as well he he's been working with cho Chen, so he'll pipe up i'm sure as we're we're going through it uh, so without further ado um let me share my screen and then maybe set a little context here uh so what we're looking for what we were looking for here is acm is all about creating and managing clusters and uh and so it made complete sense that we have this fleet of clusters what <laughs> what better place to start than to help connect those up to kcp as they provision or need to expand uh the underlying footprint so this is the administrator behind the scenes not the developer using kcp or if they've got a large bunch of a large number of clusters that they want to start to use with KCP. Again, we've got fingers into that fleet. And so it made complete sense to be able to or to work to hook KCP up and which means specifically hooking the sinkers up on these managed clusters to then point back to a KCP instance. So here I did the first part of the demo. I, I ran that audit before, which is just setting me up three three <laughs> three kind clusters one of them is uh, represents the hub and i keep saying acm but actually we're using open cluster management ocm which is the uh, community version of acm it's just the core technology for managing or working with multiple clusters so it's got that concept of my cluster that is under management which we call a managed cluster and it's got this concept of add-ons which are pieces that go along with our agent that we might want to want to run. And so I've created three clusters. One is that hub, and then two are uh, managed clusters, which are going to be my targets in this case for uh, what I want to do with KCP. Um, the last part here is after I created them in kind, I joined those clusters to my uh, to my hub. Joining is about a 60 second activity. But again, the reason I bring this up is you know, any existing customer out there with ACM is going to have provision custom clusters or have a number of clusters under management. We're also looking at moving SD, the uh, uh, service delivery team. We're looking at, at ACM, well, this portion of ACM uh, becoming a core part of that for them to do work under the covers. So again, another opportunity to introduce KCP into these spaces as as D spins of clusters as well. So pretty much anywhere that ACM has has a connection, and ACM is not specifically limited to OCP as well. So you can import any of the star KS, so AKS, EKS, IKS, etc. It works with Kind, which is what this demo is, as well as a few of our competitors like Three KS and uh, and some of the other ones. Although those we don't officially support, but because they are based off of vanilla cube, which we do, we will support, they, you know, it's able to function there. So again, starting plan, three clusters, a hub and two managed clusters that are gonna, we'll just call them my managed clusters or my workers that KCP is going to use. And I've imported those into my hub so that my hub can see them. 
And so next I'm going to bring uh, KCP online. And so we're just taking a copy of that kube config here uh, for the setup to use. And then we're going to activate KCP. So it's pulling it in. It's actually cloning the repo directly right now. It's going to do the build. We're going to start KCP up and we're going to start up an extra controller from uh, that's like that's an ACM add on controller that we built specifically for KCP. So for each add on, this is the pieces we add to our agent. We include an additional controller that is responsible for then making sure that add on lands on the correct managed clusters that we want. So we've got it built. So we're going to turn it on. So we've got the certificates and the KCP server itself is booting up. Actually, let me get a little fuller screen here. And then we're bringing up, this is the controller I just mentioned. So this is the one that's going to look at the on the ACM hub for the managed clusters and then make a determination of whether the KCP add-on should be enabled. And the KCP add-on is going to uh, deploy the sinker and connect that sinker back to a logical cluster in my KCP instance. So everything here now is up and running. I've got both of my controllers going. So let me grab the demo screen. Again, hopefully this is uh, readable. And so very first thing we're doing is on the hub. These were the managed clusters that I was talking about. So we have cluster one and cluster two. These are the two client clusters that were created and then imported. We're going to create the cluster, the add-on for Sinker. So again, this is something Chojen just put together, but it's a we have a CR type and you have multiple add-ons depending on what you want to use from the ACM or the MCE toolbox, so like policies, applications, etc. But in this case, we have one specific for KCP. We're developing one for the Hypershift managed clusters, another example of what goes in there. ACS has an add-on. And so these are you can pick and choose. But so the one for today is the Sinker. So we're actually going to apply that now. So created the resource on the hub. And so now we're going to enable it. So this controller that we have running that you saw me, that KCP OCP OCM that was launched earlier, um, this annotation on our managed cluster object is going to tell the add-ons and the add-on controllers, which number one, that I want to put Sinker there, and number two, that I want to target the logical cluster. Um, and in this case, we call the logical cluster test. So I'm going to bring both of my clusters. So I'm going to add the annotation there. And this is just one way of doing it that we did for this initial demo. We might use something like our placement rule, and you'd be able to put a specific sinker on systems that have NVIDIA GPU or systems that are in a specific region, et cetera. And these keep going. We're going to see that the add-on was created. So this is the signing request for approval that got automatically approved by our controller that tells me that the sinker add-on for both of the clusters was able to connect. And so this is just showing you that managed add-on again that was created. And so now we're going into KCP. And so this again is running in the kind server on my laptop against the cluster. So we're using the same deployer demo that we did before. We did before when we used managed or our backend instead of Sinker, but this time we're just doing strictly a Sinker piece for it. So the Sinker is just as you guys usually had it. Uh, this is just a list, the logical cluster list from internally. And so this was the one change that Chojen put, the, put in was to bind the Sinker be able to bind the sinker to the individual clusters. Um, he put in a pull request that, I'll use his words, is a bit of a hack to make that binding work. But he was expecting that there would be an eventual solution that may be different than what he proposed in the pull request. And I can link that pull request uh, after I'm done as well. And so then we're going to create the namespace. And this is inside the KCP. And we're going to create the deployment. This is the standard demo deployment that usually gets used. And so then we're going to watch the kube namespace. So we actually see the two. There's the initial deployment here. And then there's what the splitter does to the logical clusters. And so we should see all of those come online in a few seconds. We see they're coming up now. So cluster one had one, and cluster two got two. And so that's the part, the end of the, I guess, scripted portion of the uh, 
of the demo. So let me just do a quick uh, use context. We'll do cluster two because it had the two deployments. Uh, kind cluster two, and we'll do KC get deployment. And so here we have the deployment and we see it's the two by two going into the default namespace that was put there. But we also see this is the, we have the KCP syncer running here. This is what our add-on had pushed into the environment and then linked back up to the specific KCP resource. And so I can add one more cluster, six more clusters. And in this design, at least, as long as they had that annotation, then the syncer gets deployed and gets connected and I get a larger spread of devices. So that's the initial demo. Things we're, we're sort of talking about, and we're sort of we're waiting for it to see the direction KCP goes in some of these. Is it not integrated with workspaces yet? We're waiting for that to sort of, I think it's still not totally complete, but the idea being then you could create a workspace, and then we could have our controller automatically connect the syncers to it, depending on, um, depending on labeling, et cetera, as well. Um, the other one we have we've been thinking about is if you have multiple instances of KCP, is being able to deploy multiple instances of the syncer pointing to those different KCPs to be able to push down to the individual clusters. And again, I guess we're open to other, you know, I, or we're interested in other ideas or other ways to sort of slice and dice and be able to bring clusters into the KCP fold. Jason. Yeah, so this looks this looks really cool. Thank you for thank you for uh, sharing this. This looks really awesome. Uh, it seems like this is effectively a replacement or a, or a, another alternative for the cluster controller we have today. That uh, you tell it about clusters, it it reaches out. It it's responsible for installing the syncer. It's responsible for setting all of that up. I think with yeah I think two with two really uh, great benefits. One is that it uses as I understand it, it uses uh, OCM's uh, cluster registration thing. Like, like right now, what we have today is like, give us a kube config and we will take over your cluster, which is not a great value proposition for anybody wanting to use this seriously. Uh, and OCM's uh, registration process is a bit more like uh, the the spoke cluster says to the hub cluster, I would like to join here are credentials, and then they have a lease and there's like- exactly. Uh, yeah, like it's a bit more, uh, uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Secure, good, uh, solid. Uh, so that's definitely good. And uh, uh, and it's also using OCM's add-on management to install and, and maintain the syncer. Is that correct? That's right. So what's you can the... we can upgrade it, et cetera, as we need to. Gotcha. Okay. So, oh, I see. So the, so the, um, we haven't really gone through how syncers would be upgraded in uh in our world so having well having any uh answer to that is infinity times better than what we have now uh, <laughs> and um so yeah the, that's that's really exciting i'd like to i think i need to understand more about what I, what i'm seeing to like understand uh you know if there's any like problems with it but it seems it seems like a like a great replacement for the cluster controller we have today and being built on something that is already has already like walked through the minefield uh, seems like a real benefit. So thank you for this work and for sharing it with us. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll no, see, absolutely. Yeah, I'll speak to David now. I just wanted to say thanks. Yeah, that, that, that seems great. And in fact, um, my question is a bit the, the continuation of, of Jason's um, remark, which is um, I didn't see how you start KCP itself, but I assume then that you don't run the cluster controller, in fact. I was KCP was I was starting the KCP service in this flow, so it's running on my it's running in, on my laptop against the the server in this respect. Yeah, but I mean the the KCP server, you know, you do KCP start. Um, did you add the cluster controller uh, options, or is it just KCP and then? It's just KCP. Okay, so and then we, there's no contr cluster controller, and you manually install right. the syncer. That's right. Okay, well, so it, then... OCM installed the syncer. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, yeah, we manually did it. So, okay, sorry. So let me, yeah, uh, give me a second here. See how well I can type. Casey, uh, I'm on this. Get 
applied manifest work dash o see if that works yes so this is acm under the covers it has yeah. manifest work managed cluster view there's a couple of different crs so this is what's delivering the different pieces so it's got the mm. actual then it creates the namespace it creates the sinker it brings the sinker config the service yeah. account etc cetera, etc cetera. and then yeah and so sets that up with the uh coop config for the connectivity back yeah. to the yeah. to the kcp yeah. instance yeah, and I was asking this question because uh, currently in the cr cluster controller, it's a bit, you know, highly tied together, uh, several um, features. And uh, one of those features that is highly tied in the cluster controller is the uh, API management. The fact that when you join a cluster, you import the APIs among a list of, of APIs which we are interested in. You import those APIs, so mainly the CRDs that we can rebuild from. So that would be the piece. Yeah. yeah. So this is exactly what I'm looking for. So yeah, that's a piece we <laughs> want to we want to integrate then into our. We'll integrate it to this flow as well to yeah. to keep yeah. it in kind. I think for one now, one alternative I, to that, rather than you building it, is for us to move where that logic is. So yeah, that no, I don't want to. Yeah, no, I right? yeah like, my. Yeah, exactly. My objective yeah. wouldn't be to write my own; it'd be to try and bring, yeah. bring yeah, yeah. what's already there over. Absolutely. Yeah, that that, yeah. that means that we we would have to think to deco um, think about decoupling uh, the API management, which will be done by the way, because it's a hundred percent simplistic for now, and of course, it will be changed in the future. Uh, changes to you know API imports and stuff like that. Yeah, I think okay. I think the the uh you're totally right please don't rewrite this but also i didn't yeah, no 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 i uh, do not we should, yeah we no, can never. we can break it out of where it currently is and move it yeah. to somewhere either another place or part of the sinker's responsibilities or something else that yeah. uh, uh so, you might not even have to do anything right like you might yeah. just magically start getting this when the sinker is installed it, it wakes up and says here's my types and do the negotiation yeah. or something yeah, and that's, that's what i'd be promise. after that's a, that's exactly a, an idea no no i know but i that's yeah that's a solution i'd be that what we'd be after i definitely don't want to build it <laughs> yeah and so just to be sure i understand for now uh to demo what you demoed with the deployments you just had added the deployments here the manually in the logical clusters right that's right okay yeah thank you yeah. all right any other uh, sorry okay i don't think I didn't add it. We added it. Well, we included it in our payload. So this was oh. the CRD <laughs> okay. data getting there so that it'd be present for us. Okay. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And so I guess, so Jason, back to your point, this is where we can, so there's a representation of this on the, the hub side where this is all being orchestrated from. So if there's a version, you know, we change the image or something, this is where we can make a flip and roll it across the environment, roll it across a portion of the environment in an AB yeah. strategy. There's lots of opportunities there for that infra to control those infrastructure pieces. Yeah, uh, it definitely. The the sinker upgrade story is, like I said, a complete like to do. Write a sinker upgrade story, uh, yep. and so having something, especially something that would let us slowly roll it out. I think the first thing we would be able to do is just say, "Oh, a new image has been, you know, like a new sinker image is there. Let's apply it to everything immediately, which could cause, yep. you know, global yep. coverage." Absolutely. So, and and um, I said ACM number of times, but really this was all done with OCM, which is our our open source community code. Yeah. at this point awesome we haven't had to use anything special and if we did we we'll, <laughs> we would have uh we'll contribute it back to our community cool awesome. okay thank you thank you um yeah uh let me go on to the next thing i think the next thing is andy demo workspace api inheritance see how it goes uh, this is a, this is a very demo full i mean it's the end of the year so i guess this is <laughs> let's <laughs> Do them all, all at right. once. A very demo full meeting, everyone. Nice work. Okay, is the font size okay on this? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I have uh, a couple of panes here. Up top, I've got um, KCP running. So I'm just going to make that because we don't really need to see that. So this is a, a empty, clean .kcp directory. The only thing that I did was I. Um, installed the workspace CRD into the admin logical cluster. 
you're going to see a whole bunch of command lines that have the insecure skip verify and server because I'm going to be jumping around between logical clusters and I don't have them in a cube uh, config right now. So if we go into the admin logical cluster and we ask for workspaces, there are no workspaces. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, apply a couple of things. So I have a what's called a source workspace. And if we look at that, um, it literally is a workspace named source. There's nothing else in there. Um, and then the next thing I'm going to do is a target workspace. And this one inherits from source. So um, let me go ahead and apply that one as well. So now I have my two workspaces. And um, what I'm going to do is. Did you, did you apply the source workspace? Yes. Uh, up, oh, up yeah. There. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no. Good. Questions are good. Uh, so I have my two workspaces. So if we do get workspaces, you'll see source and target. Um, they're new, so they're they're empty. And what I'm going to do is um, add some other CRD. So we're going to go to um, trib CRDs. We'll go deployments. And oops, I didn't mean to put that in admin. I meant to put that in source. All right. So now we have deployments defined in both the admin cluster and the source cluster but not in the target cluster. So if we say uh, source, what sort of CRDs do you have? You'll see deployments. Um, because I goofed, you should also see that in apps or in admin, and you'll also see the workspaces. Now, the cool thing is when we look in target, you don't see any CRDs. And this is on purpose. Um, so with workspace API inheritance, what's important is that the APIs are available, but CRD happens to be an implementation detail. So um, like, we don't need a user to know that a CRD exists for the API to be available. And in fact, there's it's an anti-pattern, I would say, for an end user to check to see if a CRD exists to determine if they should proceed with using an API. That's what discovery is for. So if we go to the um, source cluster here. Actually, I'm going to just switch to make this a little shorter. So we're going to go raw, and we're going to go to clusters, source APIs, and uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, groups.name. So we're going to look at all of the uh, API groups that are available in the source cluster. And you'll see apps is down here at the bottom. Um, I don't have these sorted at the moment. And um, so that's expected, because in the source workspace, we added the uh, deployments CRD. So we would expect to see the apps API group in the source logical cluster. We go to target, though, we'll also see apps is in the target. And that's the what the inheritance is doing. If I go to some other random workspace, or I should say logical cluster, uh, you don't see apps. And that's because it's just a random logical cluster that I uh, put in right now. And there's no workspace for it. There's no um, inheritance there. So uh, I am able to do things like go into the target and say, show me deployments. And there aren't any. Um, I will go ahead and create a default namespace. And then I can say, create deployment image nginx, we'll call it foo. And I've created a deployment in the target namespace. And now if I, or I should say in the uh, target logical cluster with the default namespace, and if I get deployments, you'll see that it's there. If I go back to the source, um, don't see any deployments. And so this is another distinction um, when we're looking at a workspace that owns the CRD and a workspace that inherits the API, the data, like in this case, deployment instances, are separate. So this really is about API availability and inheritance and not about instance inheritance. So I can go ahead and create, go into the source cluster, and I can create a namespace. We'll call it default. And I can create a deployment in that source 
logical cluster. Um, I will call it foo, well, let's call it bar. So we'll put bar inside of the source logical cluster. And now if I get deployments in source, you see bar. If I go back to target, you only see foo. So they're completely separate, just like you would expect the way that the logical clusters work. I have one more thing to show you uh, that's related as well. And that has to do with the core API v1 uh, discovery and CRDs and inheritance. So if I go to clusters, um, go with target API v1. Oops. Uh, so we look at the resources that are in API v1 in the target logical cluster. These are the standard resources that KCP makes available to all logical clusters. None of these come from CRDs. So if I decide I want to go into the source logical cluster and I'm going to deploy um, a pod CRD into the source logical cluster. Now, if we go back and we say, let's take a look at discovery for target, you'll see pods and pod status have shown up. And this is aggregating and combining discovery uh, from CRDs through inheritance along with the resources that are available out of the box. And um, this obviously will work in the source logical cluster as well. And if we go to some other logical cluster, you don't see uh, pods in this section. This works for everything that you've seen except for open API schemas. Uh, because of the way that code is written, it's difficult to get those to be aggregated. So um, at least with, um, I, think that, I can't remember if that was just with Core V1. It's been a while since I looked at it. But there is some aggregation that goes on within Open API, but not all of it. I think it's just the Core V1 aggregation that's not working. So that's an area that we can explore a little bit further. Uh, the other restriction or hard coding that we have here is that this only applies for workspaces that are defined in the admin logical cluster. So if I put a workspace in some other logical cluster and had another workspace inherit from it, that will have no effect. Um, it was a limitation just for the prototyping for right now. And I know that um, Stefan and David and others have been talking about how to expand into org workspaces that would um, you know, end up changing this prototype work to support more than just one org, works, org workspace, so to speak. And I think that's about all I had to show. So any questions? I had one just to, I think, parsing, and I'm going to just regurgitate what you just said. Basically, if I have like two uh, source workspaces, one for maybe people that do database APIs and one for another group of people that do some other thing, um, with those changes, then that would be able to both flow down into one target. Is that right? Um, you can only right now inherit from one. So but you're saying with that with that work, like that limitation. Yes. Yeah, so, so don't don't take this inheritance as a concept literally. Yeah. It's for prototyping. Core pieces will go away, and we will have API imports, and then you can import the database APIs and the Kafka APIs or something. Yeah. Th this is definitely. Okay. It was an area of exploration to figure out what hackery we'd need to do to inside of Kubernetes to make this possible. Um, and Stefan is totally correct that we have an entire data model that's separate from what I just showed, where we plan to allow API producers to export their APIs and then end users to consume them through imports and you don't have to go through what I just demoed to make that happen. Uh, okay, none of that. Cool. You're just working on mechanic. Here. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And Very cool. Though. Steve has a question in chat. Do we know if workspace types or templates will use something like this, or if it will be entirely on top of API imports? Um, don't know yet. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, this is very exciting. Uh, Actually, I do have a question real quick. Uh, roughly how invasive is this to the Kubernetes code base? Is this, is this like 
tons and tons of changes to Kubernetes, or is this mainly using extension points we've put into Kubernetes um, and hacking? So I went things? through somewhere between four and six iterations for where to attack and insert this. Um, the there's nothing that I added that is um, like logical cluster specific inside of Kubernetes. I actually undid and moved some of the hacks that we had done in Kubernetes, and I was able to move them into KCP. Um, there are some pieces that I left in place because I either forgot about them or uh, decided to defer until later. So like there's portions of the CRD controller code that mm -hmm. are logical cluster aware and need to remain logical cluster aware until we can potentially find a way to um, hack on top of that instead of directly inside of Kubernetes. Yeah. So the inheritance part is all written in KCP and injected down into Kubernetes through some uh, some customizations for how to instantiate a client and a shared informer factory, um, as well as like a, a KCP specific lister for, and shared informer factory for CRDs. And the lister is logical cluster aware because the code's in KCP. Um, the API or open API aggregation currently has some, or it is logical cluster aware and that code is in Kubernetes. Uh, mainly because there right now isn't a way around it, but um, we are actively working to try and minimize any, you know, any KCP-isms in the Kubernetes code base so that we can get all this stuff going upstream. Nice. But, but I think even if we keep it like that, it's on a scale from zero to 10, maybe it's a five in pain. So it's acceptable, I think. So more we can upstream, the better, of course. Yeah. But it's it's still the the real API extension API server. This is important, I think. So we can use CRDs even for more advanced uh, concepts like API imports. Yeah, In, invisible, um, but they are used. One other thing that I'll mention that uh, wasn't like a user facing visible change in the demo was that uh, I removed our reliance on Cube Aggregator and uh, wrote what I called a mini aggregator, that it's an API server or generic API server that can aggregate the generic control plane, which is the core V1 serving, along with the API extensions API server, which uh, serves up the API extensions group itself. And then it also will aggregate anything contributed by CRDs, so like discovery and open API. And none of that requires Cube aggregator or API services. Um, so all of that has been replaced with a mini aggregator. It's in the Kubernetes code base, but there's nothing that I can think of other than the open API aggregation that is logical cluster aware. All right, um, I see Jason had to run. So David, I think you were up next in the agenda, if I'm right. Um, yes. So I show the progress on the demo I did the last um, time. Let me share my screen. Uh, this one. Let's switch there. Do you see my uh, VS code? Yep. Yeah. Sorry. It's OK. So uh, mainly, uh, that's the continuation of the last demo about virtual workspaces and the first implementation of virtual workspaces. Uh, which is mainly um, uh, to get the list of the workspaces a user um, has access to, or uh, either it's personal workspaces or the user, the, the workspaces of its organization he has rights to, to, to list. Uh, let me just clear this. So mainly I have one KCP running um, here. If I just restart it. Now, I'll show that I'm using, um, um, in addition to the last time, I'm using uh, this new um, option here uh, added when JSON added the, added the um, authentication and OIDC uh, enablement. So, uh, in, and then I have tokens to 
Uh, yep, so to be able to manage three users, mainly user one, uh, user two, and a uh, user three. So that, that means that, and then let me start that. And then I will start the command line of the virtual workspace API server that will connect to this KCP instance, of course, to find the real objects, the real workspace resources that are stored there. Uh, so let me start the virtual workspace. And also the authentication of the virtual workspace will delegate to the KCP authentication based on those tokens here. So now I can do quite the same um, than, uh, uh, start, uh, than the last time. On this virtual workspace endpoint here, I will create a um, workspace or so workspace one. I have to put the validate faults here because open API is not supported for now. And so uh, let me create a, a workspace into my personal um, environment my as, as a personal workspace. Uh, and this, um, corresponding to the last uh, demo, this um, effectively delegates to KCP and creates uh, an object, uh, a workspace object in the organiza organization logical cluster in KCP. So if I do uh, kubectl get workspaces, for example, here, I will point directly to KCP and see that workspace one has been created, delegated. Now, if I, um, I will create another one, this time with user two, uh, second user here. And now if I uh, get the list of workspaces for user one, I will see only workspace one. And the same for user two, of course. Uh, I would see only workspace. Two. Of course, if I would connect here with the token of the loopback or you know any system admin uh, user, I would see, of course, all the workspaces that exist uh, here for any user. And uh, now um, I, I also included, implemented a proposal to manage pretty names. What happens if, because all those workspaces are stored in the same logical cluster, which is mainly on one shard in KCP, uh, on the KCP uh, instance, and all the workspaces for the same organization would be stored in the same logical cluster. And so what happens if two, you, two distinct users want to create a, um, a workspace named workspace one? Uh, well, for example, workspace two. So I will do that now. If I create, sorry, just one second. If I create here workspace two, but with user one, uh, it will still create a workspace two uh, object. That means that in the context, when pointing to the uh, personal, uh, we say personal environment of the user, he would see uh, this workspace as created as workspace two. If I um, do here a kubectl get, get workspaces on this endpoint, we can see now that user one sees workspace one and workspace two. But in fact, as we can see in the URL here, if you do directly, if you get the workspace resources objects that are uh, the raw uh, workspace resources that are stored uh, in KCP under the cover, you can see that uh, this workspace named Workspace two, in the context of, of, of user one, in fact, it is uh, it has been renamed or you know disambiguated in the organization to be uh, so that the internal name is workspace two uh, with a suffix here, uh, so that it's it's unique. And then uh, if I do kubectl get workspaces, but oh sorry, not this one. If I come back and list the workspaces for user two, you can see that there is also a workspace two, but then it's the one in the context of user two, it's pointing to uh, the, the, a distinct URL because in fact, it's a distinct workspace. And the same again, if, if I delete um, workspace two, the, works, the, the workspace name workspace two for user one, here, again, user one pointing to this API server URL here, which is a per his personal one, we say 
like that. Uh, it, it would just be like it's work, Workspace 2 that has been deleted. But now um, I can see that. And, and of course, in the list, it would just see uh, only Workspace 1. But still, the, the, the Workspace 2 from User 2 uh, is, is still there, uh, as we can see now. Yes, and if we do uh, get workspaces directly into KCP, we can see that we just deleted the workspace whose pretty name was workspace two in the context of user one, but the workspace two in the context of, of user two, uh, which is a distinct workspace has been kept. So um, it's things are quite isolated, but still every uh, user will see his own personal workspaces with the, the pretty names he, he gave through uh, this you know, uh, virtual workspace here, uh, accessible uh, from this URL. And now just the last, last point, of course, we can, we, uh, there would be the, the opportunity to share a workspace so that um, if I'm part of an organization, maybe I don't have any, I, I never created a personal workspace, but if I have access to, if someone shared uh, me uh, the workspace of an organization, then I would have access to it. And especially user three has no, I never created a, a personal workspace, but then, and so of course, if we do uh, this, get workspaces for user three, we have nothing. But then just by creating a cluster role binding of the cluster role associated to workspace, to this workspace, uh, to the group, uh, which is org three here, then uh, that will allow user three to see workspace, the, the corresponding workspace in its list of workspaces and have access to it. But of course, uh, uh, here it's only uh, a cluster role binding with list or get uh, access. So if user three tries to delete that um, uh, in the organization, it would have, um, um, it wouldn't have the permission to do that. So it's sort of basic implementation, but everything delegating to KCP of uh, personal workspaces and also the basic RBAC uh, behavior that we would want more complete in the future. Any questions? Just have a comment quickly. Um, yeah. The use case for that, so it looks like we virtualize workspace names, right, per user. Um, I think there are two user stories basically behind that. One is free tier, so we could have um, workspaces which all live in one org workspace. So it's much cheaper than having another org for every user. So this mm -hmm. is one use case. And the other one is basically, yeah, maybe GitOps or something where you have workspace manifests, like for, for, for a big application, which consists out of 15 different workspaces. You can have those manifests in one place in Git and create a copy of this whole stack of 17 or 15 uh, workspaces all at once with supply. And the names wouldn't change. Like it's, it's really um, self-contained. You don't have to virtualize your names manually. So yeah, the, the next the next step, of course, uh, here we have only one organization with um, with all the workspaces inside, and the next step would be uh, to support one, several organizations, and and then being able to you know, associate quite the same way as it, as it has been done here, associate a user with an org, uh, and then being able to um, get the workspaces in the logical cluster associated with this organization. So I had two questions. Um, the yeah. OIDC token file had separate orgs for each of the users. Yeah. So, well. Yeah. Sure. Well, well that, I guess that, why, why were they looking at the same workspaces? Yeah, that was uh, at the very beginning to you know make a distinction between um, rights associated to the subject itself, uh, to the to the user, and and permissions given to a group of user. So, but but of course, the the orgs that are here in the token file, these are not. I mean, currently, at least, directly linked to what we call organizations. You know, a logical cluster for workspaces. 
obviously in the future i think that there, there would be some logic to match an organ organization with her back groups as well but i mean for now it's just it was just an example uh, of using group permissions uh, to, to provide visibility and the other question i had was uh do we have the is there a binding object how does the user rename things yes exactly uh, so there is a um, um, cluster role for admin uh, rights on the workspace and then uh, cluster role binding from directly from the user uh, to the um, cluster role associated to this workspace so th those these are uh, cluster roles with named resources so we're achieving the workspace name aliasing through a cluster role? Yes. Why? No, 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 to, to the, through the cluster role binding. I mean, the, it's the role binding. Alternate, alternative five of the document for the details. It's a, yeah. we need something like um, unique names. And if we have a naming schema for some object, which is a role binding at the moment, um, we get that for free, basically. So we can detect collisions in names for user. Because you, yeah, when when you create a um, on the personal um, virtual workspace, when you create a workspace, the first thing we will do is uh, try to create the cluster role binding um, with the name being the pretty name of the workspace that the end user wants in its environment in this context and the the uh, concatenate to the to the user so this ensures that the unity that so that the end user cannot have two workspace with the same pretty name uh, in for a given user i mean is the use of rbag just an optimization i guess i was surprised to see that I mean, it's it's. I assume it's more, you know, using what we have to now today. Obviously, uh, this could be stored in other type of types of objects. But... Yeah, we we could have a third object where we thought maybe we don't need that because we have two already roles and role bindings. But okay. yes, we could externalize that. Would work as well. So it's a little yeah. trick at the moment. Yes. And and. So like if with yes, with this, do we have the concept like if I just gave user three access to something, can he alias it? Or does he need edit access to his role bindings? Not sure I understood the question, sir. So in the in the demo, you gave user three access to a workspace he didn't create. What if he now wants to give it a new name in his context? Um yeah, he would be. Yeah, the thing is, of course, what I did is I created a role binding here. Um, we um, to to the the you know list role uh, for this workspace. Of course, I did that manually. I assume that in the in in a in a real implementation, you know, which would which we would go towards, um, we would probably use some sort of sub resource on the uh, workspace. Uh, sub resource to share, for example, uh, at the org level or at the personal uh, level, and in which case uh, we would be able to, you know, probably. And I assume also there would be some way to, for the user to re to change the pretty name, um, also maybe as a sub resource of the personal workspace uh, workspace resource. So I mean, since since we are in this virtual workspace, you know, slash personnel, where or slash organization, then we have also the freedom to add sub resources for anything or any additional um, features that we would um, want, uh, especially sharing or stuff like that, where we would, where we would like to plug um, additional uh, logic that uh, any additional logic that would be necessary. Well, Renaming was my example. We could do that this way, like you would access the org workspace and do the necessary modifications. And then it suddenly shows up in a different name. 
after shaving, of course, it's some some artificial suffix name probably, which is used. Yeah, but the thing is, is since we 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 before coming to the you know KCP layer where workspaces are stored, since we go through this um, virtual workspace uh, layer of where we have all the freedom to code, then we can um, do all the checks that are necessary for this type of additional uh, actions. That does it answer, Steve? I, I guess. Um... I don't know that I understand like well enough when we might want a new sub resource, uh, and I certainly understand like the object fan out comment. But it seems like if we want to bind names to something unique to a user, and a user should always be able to change names, implement implementing that via code in a sub resource. I guess wouldn't have been the first thing that I thought of, but I'm not sure I understand this. No, I, I think the subspace well is, is for permissions mainly, so we can add an, an not really served sub resource and use it for ABAC for renaming, for example. You would be able to to add something to the full binding or change it. Although with normal permissions, you wouldn't. Can you change the name of a role binding? Or are they entirely immutable? I can't remember which you, part is immutable. You can. Recreated for sure. Yeah, you recreated. Okay. Anyway, you just take it as as one trick to, to implement that. We could change that. We <laughs> yeah, that's a model for that. Yeah, I didn't have time to to do anything else than you know creating the rule binding manually to to show um, the possibility of sharing more spaces. But obviously, it would not be by creating the rule binding manually uh, um, in in the final. Implementation. Yeah, there's 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 one general thought behind that. Not every user should be able to access the org workspace and see what's going on there. Sure. Right. Yeah. That's why we encode things and the virtual workspace uses that data and shows some logical representation for user. Any any other question? I think that's it. Do we have anything else on the agenda? All right. Any other topics somebody wants to bring up before we close it out? All right. Then I will stop the recording. Thank you all for joining us.